Y'all stand and let's sing, let my life be a lie. Johnny, you ladies?
Instead of we three, you got us two tonight. Try it. We may mess up. from Emmanuel's veins The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved and Since then I walk in forgiveness All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past Broken at last, I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold on my life. I got Jesus. How good I want. I've received nothing but goodness I've tasted and tasted your grace I was so lost till I fell at the cross And God saved, oh I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord Sister Ava, come on up. I'm not going to say that was the devil. I think that was more the Lord because I talked to Ava this week about even when you mess up, if it be the music or you're singing or you're playing, you just keep going. So that was just showing you that Grandpa and Mr. Ray, they just kept going even though the music kind of skipped a little bit. So we're all good. All right, before she... Um, shares one of her talents that she's learned, I want everybody to practice something for me, okay? I want y'all to smile, okay? I want y'all to go like this, okay? I want you to clap. Can y'all clap? Okay. <laughs> See, it's not that bad. It's not that bad at all, okay? So then Sunday morning, or actually Wednesday night, and then Sunday morning, Sunday night, y'all do that whenever I'm playing and everybody else is singing. So, um, no, but I do want to put in a little plug for you. Um, Ava came up probably eight months ago, I guess, begging to learn to play piano. 
And of course, summertime was coming and all that, so we put it off, put it off. Um, and she just has a heart to, to learn the Lord's music. We were trying to learn little, other little songs, but she has just picked up on hymns more so than anything else. Um, and I want to encourage y'all um, to use your talents. God has given y'all talents, and I'm not talking about just musically or singing or, you know, y'all have so many, whether it be dealing with financials or decorating the church, or, you know, ministering to people. God has given you a talent. Find it and use it, okay? And on that plug, since we're starting Easter music next Sunday, okay, those of you who I know can carry a tune, even if you can't carry a tune, it's all for the praise of the Lord, right? Amen. Okay, all right, I've made Ava long enough sitting there by herself, so uh, remember those three things we practiced, okay? Hey, appreciate that for our youth and younger people to come up, and especially these hymns, these older songs. We appreciate that, Miss Ava. We really do. And uh, glad to have what visitors we have. And Brother Greg from our association office, we pray that you be here with us tonight. Uh, now, Sarah, have to behave yourself tonight. Now, Greg, back of you, I want you to know. <laughs> hey, God bless you. Thank you, Miss Carmen, for them words, and especially for teaching these people how to smile, you know. <laughs> it helps you to preach if someone to smile once in a while. You know, when you, if you don't smile and get active, it's kind of hard, hard to preach. I, I'm telling you so. I appreciate that so much. All right, and we have announced Brother Marshall. We know that uh, tomorrow night at Hart's Funeral Home from 6 until 8 or 6 until, until at Hart's Funeral Home will be the viewing. And uh, Brother Marshall, as Miss Yvonne said, had his uh, funeral already wrote out, and uh, she's trying to follow it the best that she could for his, what she is, he had asked for. Tuesday, they're going first to the cemetery. Kind of unusual, I know, but that's the way he wanted it laid out. So they go into the cemetery first at uh, Laura Chapel Cemetery. And they will have a service there. How long, I don't know, but it would be at 2 o'clock at uh, the cemetery for that service. And uh, like I say, that all the plans are not worked out, songs or whatever else they want. They're not sure yet what all they're going to be doing at uh, the cemetery. But at 3.30, Tuesday, they want to have the funeral here in the church, 3.30. Brother Don Patterson is going to preach the, the service. And then afterwards, we will be feeding the family, and uh, they said supper, and that's about what time it'll be. It'll be supper time by the time we get through. But I uh, know it's a little different, but, uh, and I don't know about all the song service and everything else, but that's all the information that I have right now. And if it's changed, we're certainly trying to let you know but uh, one thing for sure, when you do this for someone, you only have to do it one time. 
just one time, and it's over. So we'll do the best we can to try to make everything as, uh, as great as we can for Brother Marshall. That's the way he wanted it. So thank you. We appreciate it. If anybody can, and we'll support the family. <clears throat> okay, tonight, <clears throat> I'm glad half of you come back. Cause we've about got half the crowd we had this morning, so I'm glad half of you come back. Anyway, tonight, uh, Revelation chapter 11, preaching through the book of Revelation, book of Hebrew on Sunday morning. Uh, book of Revelation, verses 1 through 13 in chapter 11, uh, the tribulation witnesses. Uh, Remember I told you this morning a lot of times that you go on vacation and you go to these welcome centers and you can remember this in your Bible when you turn and start studying a portion of your Bible and uh, you go to the welcome centers and find out where you're at. They'll have a map of that state and they draw it out and they have a pen or either a dot or something. Here you are right here. Well, that's what we need to understand when you start studying the book, studying a portion of Scripture to find out exactly where you're at. Well, we know where we're at in the book of Revelation from chapter 6 to chapter 19. We're in what they call the Great Tribulation, the Great Tribulation time. And uh, we have been dealt with these three different types of the judgment that's coming to this world after the rapture. We know the rapture is going to come, and the Christians will not be here on this earth. We'll be called away in the rapture. But we also know why we call away in the rapture. We'll be in heaven in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And all while we'll be in heaven, we will go through the judgment seat of Christ and the great supper of the Lamb. And while that's happening here on this earth, they'll have wrath that they've never had before and never will be again. And uh, we study these, this different wrath. We have the seven seals. We have the, the seven trumpets and seven bowls of wrath. In these things, you look like it's, as you see, it's happening. It look like you turn the page and next things happen, next things that happen. But to find out where you're at. The same period of time is going over and coming back and going over and coming back and going over again. The seven seals going over, coming back. The seven trumpets going over, and then we'll have the seven bowls of judgment going over. During that period of time, <clears throat> they're going to be at the three and a half years, they're going to be something very strange and very different happening at the time of the great tribulation time. And that is they're going to be a temple rebuilt and two of these witnesses. Now, at this time... There's a lot, of, a lot of, of opinion and also various things to study in the book of Revelation, especially in this chapter we own right now. And as I told you, no man, no person knows all the details of the Bible, cannot understand all the details of the Bible and everything. If we did, we'd be a God. But only God's mind. But when you're in the book of Revelation, some areas you do not understand, you remember the, the book of Revelation, the purpose of the book of Revelation, no matter where you're studying, no matter where you're reading, what you're doing, the purpose of Revelation is the word revelation. <clears throat> that word means to unveil. And you're unveiling Jesus Christ. You're looking to see where Jesus Christ at in his unveiling. You will see Jesus Christ different in the book of Revelation than any other time or any other scripture in the whole Bible. You'll be unveiling him, or the Word of God is unveiling Jesus Christ. So don't get disturbed <clears throat> if you do not understand a lot of things as they unfold in the process <clears throat> of studying the book of Revelation. Just look for Jesus Christ, where he's at in unveiling of Jesus Christ. Uh, very unusual. Uh, we have uh, prophecy in this chapter i like for us to look at the, first of all, the temple worship. Now, as you understand this temple worship, uh, i like to read the first two verses of this temple and this temple worship. Very unusual, we find here. And it says in verse 1 and 2, And there was given me, I was talking about John, a reed like to a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months is three and a half years. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, Lord, for allowing us, O oh God, to have a portion of your word. To understand, Father, that, Lord, how bad, Lord, the times will be on this earth. And, Lord, thank you and praise you that 
We will not be here as Christians. And Lord, we want to thank you for calling us out of this world, Father, the rapture. And now, Father, the Christians won't have to go through this great time of this tribulation. We thank you and we praise you. We just pray, God, that we may understand we need a witness to everybody we can. Father, they may be saved before this great time of outpouring of your wrath upon this earth. We thank you and we praise you for those on our prayer list and for the privilege we have of prayer. We thank you and we praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this day in the blessed name of our Savior. Amen. What we'll be studying tonight now is a temple. Now, there's going to be a future temple rebuilt at this time. Now, <clears throat> when Jesus Christ, when I was preaching to you this morning about Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, when Jesus Christ was here on this earth and everything that Jesus Christ done, he fulfilled all the types and all the shadows of everything of the tabernacle and in the temple. All was completed through Jesus Christ. So we ask the, uh, the question, <clears throat> Why do they need a temple? To understand the Jews do not believe that Jesus Christ is their Messiah as a whole. The nation Israel do not believe in Jesus Christ. They believe he's going to come, but he hadn't come yet. They have their Old Testament, and that's what they go by. But they're waiting for the Messiah to come. They're going to build another temple. The temple says it's going to be it's going to be built in the Word of God. Okay, so why the temple? And what temple is this that's going to be rebuilt? It's going to be rebuilt. We know well, Solomon built the first temple, David's son. David wanted to build a, a temple for God, but he says, no, you are a warrior. We'll let your son build it. So Solomon built the first temple. Well, it was destroyed by old Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, and and. 583 B.C. before Jesus Christ. Zerubbabel was another temple. It was rebuilt, restored, but it was re uh, destroyed in 168 A.D. And then remember whenever Jesus Christ was walking on earth, there was Herod Temple. Now, it was destroyed. Jesus Christ said there won't be one stone left upon another. O Titus, in the year of 70 A.D., after Jesus Christ came in and that temple was destroyed. Well, what temple is it? Well, there's some temples in our day that the Bible mentions. What temple is he talking about? Well, in first uh, Corinthians 6 and 19, I believe it is, says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Here's a temple now. This is another temple. Now, the church is also considered a temple, and Ephesians 2 and 21 said, In whom all the building firmly fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Well, there's a lot of temple, but we still hadn't hit the temple that we're talking, going to be talking about tonight. If you read the book of Ezekiel, about four or five chapters, from chapter 40 and on, you'll find that there's going to be a temple built in the time we call the millennial, when Jesus Christ is on this earth. For a thousand years, after a tribulation time, they're going to be a temple called the Millennial Temple. Well, that's still not the one we're talking about. Which one are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the one, I'm telling you, that's going to be built at a time of the Great Tribulation. The first thing we see, we see uh, this temple worship there, a, a city going to be involved. It said there in verse 2, the Holy City. What is the holy city? It is Jerusalem. Remember when Jesus Christ was tempted, he was carried up on the top of that temple and says, you know, the devil says, go ahead and throw yourself down. God will raise you back up. That temple, Herod's temple, the city of Jerusalem is called the holy city. Of all the cities in the world, y'all heard anything about Jerusalem lately in the news? About old Trump and what he's done? Moving our Embassy to Jerusalem. Now, it has made the Muslim people as mad as they can be. And do you think that makes them mad? You just wait till the Jews has a pact with the Antichrist at the tribulation time, and the old Antichrist, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, the Antichrist give them permission to build this temple. They will be an outrage as never been before of the Muslims of this world. This holy city, as we see, 
the Bible predicts they're going to build this temple in Jerusalem. Now, for hundreds of years, this prophecy was attacked by critics as saying this cannot happen. This is impossible for them to build a temple in Jerusalem. Why? Well, the first reason, because the Jews, for many, many years, the Jews did not occupy any land. They was carried away into captivity, and they died as a nation. For 2,500 years, the Jews died as a nation. But they was resurrected again. The only nation that ever have went into exile by the Jewish nation did and was really was brought back to life because God said, I'll bring you back. I'll bring you from all nations of the world. They was carried away in the captivities. For 2,500 years, they did not have a land. They did not occupy Jerusalem. They did not have a land to call their own. This nation returned and was revived again. In my lifetime, and a lot of you as old as I am and older, to understand that we have lived and witnessed that what God said he would do and bring them back to their homeland. In 1940s, they became a state again. That prophecy could be fulfilled now because they control Israel. But... They couldn't be a temple because at that time, when they was a nation, they did not have the occupation rights to Jerusalem. For the temple must be built. But in June in 1967, there was a war, Israel war, as you all know, and you all lived through it. And they had that war, and they moved all the way into Jerusalem, the city, and drove all the way back to what you see on television. The Wailing Wall is in Jewish territory now. And they had a commander-in-chief that led that army, <clears throat> Moshe Dayan. And here's what he said in history. He wrote down for you to read and for me to understand. No power on earth shall ever remove us from this spot again. In 1967, the city of Jerusalem became occupied by the Jewish nation. But there was another barrier that couldn't be built, they said. Because they could not find out where the Holy of Holy was, and it has to be in the exact spot. Because if anybody in the Holy of Holy would step out of place, they were scared they would die. It got to be built in the exact spot. They couldn't find the location, but they began to do some digging for many, many years. Now they found the cornerstone. They know exactly now. I can prove this to you. You can find it in the history. I can prove this to you. They know exactly where the pillar was. They know exactly where the Holy and Holy is going to be built at in that city. But now there was another hospital where they couldn't do it because what is sitting on the place where the temple mound must be built is the, a Muslim monastery. The Mosque of Omar controlled by the Islam people. Now God has moved all these other barriers, has he not? And the Jews believe that God will remove this one also. He will remove it. So there is a city involved, which is Jerusalem. But you see there's a chronological order involved in this. What is it all talking about? Well, verse 3 said the Gentile will tread upon the foot of this city now for 42 months. You know how long that is? 
three and a half years. Right in the center of the great tribulation time is three and a half years, 1,206 days, three and a half years. Several times in the book of Revelation, this is mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. It says, To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, and she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, that's one year, times, that's two years, and a half time, that's a half year from the face of the serpent, that great serpent called the devil. Three and a half years. At that time, the temple's going to be rebuilt in the tribulation time, this temple. Well, how close are we to this coming? All these prophecies, everything we see fulfilled, how close are we? Do anybody really think that we're very close? You think it is real close? Well, here's some scriptures for you. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Listen to what it says. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day is he talking about? He's talking about the rapture of the church. Except they come a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, which is the Antichrist. They're going to be a fallen away of God's people from the church, from worshiping for serving Jesus Christ in a local church in his word. They're going to be a fallen away first. And then it says, who oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitting in the temple now this in the middle of this three and a half years of God showing himself that he is God. This is going to happen and it's happening right now. Where's all God's people tonight? There's a great falling away whether you realize it or not. We are very, very close. When the nations of the world, when people... It's even called Christians. <clears throat> when they stop coming to church, and that church means absolutely nothing, we're living in a time of churchless Christians. They stop worshiping means absolutely nothing to them and their family. Worship church on Sunday night, Wednesday night means nothing to them whatsoever. Against the principle and the teaching of the Word of God, we know the time is near. As we know, the Jews do not believe in Jesus Christ at this time. <coughs> Excuse me. But in this time, about three and a half years, they, you know what? They're going, to make a, they're going to make a peace treaty, or Antichrist is going to make a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. And the Jews, by him, is going to be able to permit to rebuild their temple. And when this happens now, see, for many, many years they have not had a temple. They don't have a temple over there now. You see, you don't sacrifice any. The Jews don't sacrifice anywhere they want. There's only one place in this earth that the Jews sacrificed, and that was in the temple. The only place that God met with the Jews was in the tabernacle in the temple, in the holies of holies. Only one place on this whole big world that he met with anybody, and that was the Jews in the holies of holies. You see, in the time of Jesus Christ, and even in our time, there's... There's a lot of worship services that they call there that the Jews worship, synagogues. But that's not a temple. And they don't offer sacrifices in the synagogues. That's a type of church like us today. On this place, the sacrifice was in a temple. Boy, they're going to be tickled to death. Now they're going to be able to sacrifice again. Now, I can show you some information from Israel that they're already getting ready to rebuild their temple. They're already studying the Old Testament laws of sacrifice and get the instruments ready. They got the priesthood ready to move in because they think it's going to be any time. They think it's going to be any time they'll be able to do this. The Jews permitted now to rebuild their temple, and they're going to be singing praises to the Antichrist for allowing them to do this. He's going to be a great God. In the midst of this temple worshiping, they begin to worship, then the Antichrist comes in. And states himself and demands that the whole world worship him as God. At that time, we see something else involved. We see the chastisement that's involved here. This temple will be under the wrath of God Almighty. It'll be under the wrath of God Almighty. I mean, in verse 1, it says a, a rod, a measuring rod. Well, the measuring rod is a symbol of judgment and chastisement, always in the Bible. God's going to call the Gentile nations. You know the 
Islamic is Gentile nation. We're Gentile, but they also are Gentile. He's going to call the Gentile nation together to the holy city and trod that nation, overrun that nation for three and a half years. And then something very strange is going to happen. During that time, there are going to be two witnesses. This most astounding, amazing prophecy that I ever read and study. Look at the inauguration of these two ministries in verse 3. And it says there in verse 3, And I will give power unto these two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. thousand two hundred sixty days. You know how long that is? Three and a half years. Three and a half years during the tribulation time. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of this earth. Now, as I told you, the book of Revelation is wrote in symbols and signs. The first chapter, it was wrote and was signed, signs, signs, and symbols. Now, why I've told you many times, why is this book and why we have so many symbols and signs in the Bible? Because you know this day that our language changes. The words mean the same thing whenever I was coming up, don't mean the same thing today. Words have a meaning in all languages to change their meaning into generations to come. Symbols and signs never change. That's the reason God gave it to us in this way. And symbols and sign. So we see the symbol and the sign here of this ministry they're going to have. Now it says olive trees. This is a symbol now of the olive tree because the olive oil will assemble the Holy Spirit. The two olive trees. Candlesticks is a symbol of the witness. So these two men is going to be the witness of God on this earth with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. God always has his witness. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be some dark times in a time we call tribulation. Did you all know that? As I said, the time has never been before and will never be again. That's going to be some bad times. Hear me. I'm glad I'm not going to be in it. But God always has his witness, no matter how darkest the days may be. In the day of the flood, Noah... For 120 years he preached, and only his family got saved in the ark. They was dark day, but God had his witness upon all mankind. They did not believe the word of God. And it's kind of says whenever Jesus Christ gets ready to come back, be the same as it was in Noah's days. Very few people wants to hear the word of God anymore. Churches are changing. What they want to do is invite the world into the church. But God always has his witness. Noah preach truth and righteousness always you'll have faithful people to speak forth the word of God and witness for God verse 3 it says they prophesied in sackcloth now remember again symbolize when you read that sackcloth you remember all the Old Testament how the people when they was in mourning had sackcloth it's a symbol now of mourning to announce a doom that's coming they was in sackcloth they're preaching we find out the subject of their preaching now. And here's what they was preaching. This temple that y'all building, you Jews, that y'all building, why y'all building this? Jesus Christ fulfilled all this, which they don't believe in Jesus Christ. But they're preaching that Jesus Christ fulfilled all the types and all the shadows. Why do you need this temple? This temple ain't a thing in the world but a sham. These two witnesses said this temple is just a sham. It's a hoax. Why are you building this temple? And the Jews hates them. They hate these two witnesses for what they are prophesying and what they are telling the truth in righteousness. Verse 5 says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemy. And if any man will hurt them, he, shall, he must in this manner be killed. Buddy, nobody can stop them. I don't know, maybe they get shot with a bullet and the bullet goes around them. I don't know how God's going to do it. But they will not die. They will keep preaching. They will keep preaching and keep preaching. People don't want to hear it, but God's word's going on. They're going to keep preaching. Nobody can kill them. You know what it says in verse 5? They're indestructible. 
They cannot die. They cannot die. Nobody can stop them. These two witnesses. Who are these two witnesses? Well, there are a lot of speculations. I can tell you what I think. You up to your own self. It really don't matter where is Jesus Christ in it. But I believe it's Moses and Elijah. Well, why would you say that? Verse 6. These have a power to shut heaven that it rain not in these days of their prophecy and have power over the waters, turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of? The power. Elijah had the power and the keys to shut up heaven and it rained not for three and a half years. He had the power to turn those keys on and it rained again. I believe one of those people there is going to be Elijah. Who was it in the time of let my people go in Egypt stood and with a plague turned all the water into blood by the power of God? Moses. If you believe what I believe, we're all right. But that's not the biggest point. I believe it's Elijah, and I believe it was both for two or three different reasons. Well, whenever Jesus Christ was on the Mount of Tribulation, you know what? There was three appeared. Who was they? Jesus Christ, Moses, and Elijah. Why? Moses and Elijah. One represented the prophet, the other represented the law. Jesus Christ. It also says in Malachi 4 and 5, I look this up, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord that he will come. I'll send you Elijah. Well, I just hope, you know, that we understand that. But you see, we have here now these ministries. The completion of these two prophets, they're going to have a time that they complete their prophesying here on this earth. Verse 7 says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. When did this happen? After God got through with them. You are, my brothers and sisters, indestructible as a child of God as long as God wants to use you for whatever he wants to use you for. When that day is over, it don't matter what hospital you're in or how many doctors around you, when God gets through with you, you're going home. When they got through prophesying what God wanted them to say, when they was finished, they went home. God determines death and life of God's children. The safest place in the world, let me tell you, it's in the will of God no matter where you're at. Oh, Richie Adams says sometimes he gets kind of scared over there in, in, the, in the jungles. But I tell you what, as long as he's in the will of God, he's safer in the jungle. He is here, or you and me, and I better sleep in our home house tonight as long as we're in the will of God and he's in the will of God. Their ministry, when they finish their testimony, now verse 8, after they, had, they was killed, it listed verse 8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. What city is that? Jerusalem which spiritually is called Solomon in Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. That means Jerusalem. Amazing thing called the great city, which is Jerusalem. Spiritually is called Sodom. Why? Because of his vice. Egypt, it says, is because of its violence. The holy city, Jerusalem, filled with vice and vanity and violence. But these two prophets was killed. I mean, they killed them then. Verse 9 says, And they of the people and the kindreds and the tongue and the nation shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. Now, up until a few years ago, they said, Well, this prophecy cannot come true with the critics because it is impossible for what happened in Jerusalem to see what happened on those streets to be seen all around the world. I asked you today, is it possible today? There's a little thing circling around our globe called a satellite. 
And you see everywhere you go, up in the mountains, out in the country, you know, Richie Adams is out there in the huts in the jungle. You'll see these satellite dishes. Uh-huh. Everything that's happening in Jerusalem could be seen all over the world right now. I don't know if that's the way it's going to happen. I'm just telling you the technology is here already. And they're going to wash these dead bodies. They won't be buried. The technology is here right now. And verse 10 says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. Now the Jews demanded that anyone died was buried as soon as possible. Just as soon as possible they was, they was put out of sight. But these dead bodies was not demanded to be put out of sight. Why? Well, it said in the verse of Scripture, I done read you because they tormented them. They're preaching, they're prophesying, tormented them. And it says the ones that they did torment, those that dwell upon the earth. Remember, all through the book of Revelation, there's a phrase going, those that dwell upon the earth, the earth dwellers, the earth dwellers. What does that mean? It's those that decided this earth is the only world they're living for. The earth dwellers, and this is a group of people, and they're around today. They living right around us today. They in this community today. They're earth dwellers, and decide this is the only world that they want to live in. But I'm gonna tell you, this world is gonna be done away with in the Book of Revelation. It tells us that. Tormented them. They're preaching what it done. They're preaching bug them. And I can tell you today, when you preach the word of God, it bugs a lot of people, and some of them won't come back to hear you. They won't come back. They don't want to hear it. Me, a sinner, need to be saved? They don't want to hear the preaching of the Word of God. You see, it said there in verse 10, that made them, made them merry. They sent gifts to one another. You know what this is? A devil Christmas. It's a devil Christmas. Why are they doing this? To those, done it, those that dwell upon the earth, thought they had closed the mouth of God. These two witnesses tell them about that temple and everything they're doing is a sham that Jesus Christ has already come. But he made them so mad. They were so glad because they thought they had shut the mouth of God. Did you know today that you're living in a time, you're living in a country, you're living in an area, you're living in a community where there are forces that in their society would like to stop the mouth of God by shutting the mouth of his preachers that wants to preach the word of God in a conservative setting church. They would love to see this church and all churches to quit having service on Wednesday night, and a lot of churches have. They would like to see the force moved in where churches quit having church on Sunday night and quit worshiping the Lord on Wednesday night and Sunday night, and a lot of churches have. They would like to see Sunday school and all Bible study completely tuck away, which some churches have. They would like for us to close the doors of this church on Sunday morning, which some churches have. There's a force to close the mouth of God. We see it in our politics of our country. This is a war against good and evil in our country today in our politics. You're either for God or you're against God because they want to close the mouth of God. They want to get rid of everything in this country that reminds them of God. That's happening in forces today. This is going to happen will happen in the time of the great tribulation time that's going to study. Whose side are you on about closing the doors of a church on Wednesday night? Whose side are you on that comes closing the door on Sunday night or Sunday school? There's a force today. Lord, have mercy upon a church that don't want to have services on Wednesday night and also Sunday night. For God says, whenever you gather together, don't forsake the gathering yourself together. 
There's no other way to worship God except in spirit and truth. Well, let's see what happens. It says these earth dwellers, they're having a good time. Man, we've got rid of the voice of God. These two men laying dead, we see them. And you know what? We see something that's going to happen. We see something happen. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Think about this, the great woe. They understood now that they had missed the rapture because that was a rapture of these two men. But those will never get raptured at that time as they're looking, as they're seeing what happened. Then the great and the terrible woe. Verse 13. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake there slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrightened, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Man, that sounds good, don't it? That sounds good. You mean they got saved? Not on your life. It said they gave glory to the God of heaven. All they done was recognize and acknowledge the power of God. As I told you, nobody can look up to heaven and see God. That's his handiwork. And I told you Wednesday night, there's nobody never going to be saved by believing there's a God. You're not saved by believing a God. You see the power of God? You see the power of God in the mountains. You see the power of God when the wind blows. You see the power of God when the sun rises. But you're not saved because you believe in eternal God. But you must believe in Jesus Christ. He just shows you the way. It says, they gave glory to the Lord of heavens. They acknowledged the power of God in a time of judgment. Well, people rarely get saved. Because people rarely get saved in a time of judgment. The Bible said, the goodness of the Lord leadeth man to repentance. I'll tell you, in my closing, I have seen this several times, just exactly what happened. It says they gave glory to the God of heavens. I have been called and been around people in the hospital. They was there, sometimes terrible disease. Lord, I want to pray for me. I hadn't been to church. I hadn't done this. I hadn't done that. But I'll tell you, if God uh, heal me and let me get out of here, I will be at church. I can name you a man that some of you know. I didn't even know he was saved. He said he was. I, I don't know who's saved who's lost. But he had a terrible time in the hospital for several days. And he said, I'll tell you one thing. If God will let me live, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I'll be there every time the door is open. God healed him. He got out. By my knowledge, I don't know if he ever come to church or not. But he acknowledged that a time of judgment and a time of great sorrow, he acknowledged the glory and the power of God. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. But I tell you, that type will not get you to heaven. That's what they done. How many times have people said, well, I tell you, boy, if I just, you know, God just helped me. Boy, I'm in a bad, anytime we get in a bad fix, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Boy, if God just helped me, if God just helped me, I tell you what, I'll do this and I'll do that. And just as soon. I don't matter if it's a heart attack. I don't people have heart attacks. I have all type of problems. You know what it looks like to me. The problem some people have, and God has brought them through it. They say, oh, God, if you do this, I, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Look like to me, you couldn't keep them out of church with a, tractor to pull them away from church they'd break free and get here any way they could but you can't drag them to church with a tractor they don't want to acknowledge God what's wrong with them same thing wrong with these people they was earth dwellers they was earth dwellers how many times how many times you see it might be a heart problems you know it might be cancer it might be some of the other diseases well, they, everybody intends to get right, don't they? Everybody I know always intends to get right. Later on, tomorrow, next day, next week, young people, when I get old, I get old, I will, 
Wait, I'll wait till you know I'm dying, and then I ask God to, to save me. You might not have time. People may not have time. You know, God don't owe anybody anything. And if you have an opportunity to be saved just like tonight and you turn it down, you know God is not in any way obligated to ever give you another chance to be saved. Whew. And they won't come to church. They some people that are sick already. Right? They, you couldn't get them here. God's healed them and touched them. You know, they ain't, they ain't coming. They ain't coming. Could you understand that? I can't understand it. What they have done, they acknowledge the power of God under judgment. And that is not repentance to get you to heaven. Jesus Christ says, I'm the way and I'm the only way. You know what Jesus Christ does in a sitting like this right here at a church service? He walks in and out on every pew. Every pew, he's walking in and out. And every pew. You know, he knows who's saved and who's not. I'm certainly glad that's not my job. But he stops. He sees that person is not saved. And he shows them there his hands. He says, you know, you see those scars? I've done this for you. How could anybody turn down a Savior who was willing to die for them on the cross? I do not understand. But they will. And the evidence they have not accepted him because they have no care or no concern about the things of God whatsoever. You cannot love God without loving his Bible and loving his word. And you cannot love God without loving his people. You cannot love God without worshiping with his people. Call together to worship. God has called us together to worship him in truth and in spirit. That is the only way. People say, well, we're doing so-and-so, we're doing so-and-so to worship God. No, they're not. And I'm going to tell you one thing. God has got one way to worship him, and it's his way, and it's not your way or what somebody's cooked up in some new church or another It started somewhere or another. It's God's way. And I tell you something, well, there's a principle in the Word of God that will never change. You'll never change the principle of the Word of God. As we come with a song of invitation, and I tell you, I can praise the Lord Jesus Christ because I'm not going to be in the time of this great tribulation. I believe in the raptured church, don't you? I believe all saved people is going to be raptured up. How about your family? Everybody here saved tonight? Everybody saved tonight? That means you're not going to be in the tribulation time. But how about your family? How many of your family loves the Lord Jesus Christ? How about our family, loved ones, friends, or neighbors? How many love to worship Jesus Christ in a church service? There's some evidence I can tell you. We don't know who's saved, who's lost, but I know one thing. The Bible says you can tell by the fruit when they want to come and worship the things and give that God gives glory to, and that is one of the things in his church. He's one that sets it up. You see, it's all about surrender. Have you surrendered tonight to Jesus Christ? We say commitment. We need a lot of commitment. We don't have much commitment today. Don't have much commitment. Our younger generation ain't much commitment. The older generation ain't much commitment. Ain't much commitment. You know, ain't not much commitment to people working on jobs. Ain't much commitment in marriage anymore. Ain't much commitment. We need commitment. But the word is not commitment. The word is surrender. Because if you surrender, it'll take care of your commitment. Because the one that you surrender to draws up all the rights of your surrender. When Japan surrendered to the United States on that ship out there in Tokyo Bay, the United States had a treaty that drawed up with them. Unconditional surrender. 
I, as the United States and Allied forces, wrote up the terms that they wanted. And it was signed by the Emperor of Japan. Because the one they were surrendering to had the power to write this treaty. Jesus Christ wrote up the treaty that you to live by. It's not commitment because when you commit to something, you're still in control. But when someone comes to rob you with a gun and says, stick up your hands, get on your knees, give me your money, you know what you're doing? You're surrendering. Commitment, you're still under control of commitment. I commit what I want to. Somebody say, well, I committed. I commit on Sunday morning, but I'm not going to commit Sunday night. I'll go find me a church that don't handle Sunday night, or I'll find one that don't handle Wednesday night. I'll be committed, but I'll be committed the way I want to be. You might be committed, but you're not surrendered to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ has brought up that treaty between you and Him. And all you have is surrender. That's all you have. You surrender, you don't surrender. And when you surrender, it'll take care of that word called commitment yeah we need commitment but you say but we're surrendering to take care of it God bless you that we stand and sing this song thank you for being here tonight anybody Jesus Christ has talked to whatever's on your heart and your mind praying for your family loved ones are you sure they're saved Jesus King Come back tonight. Would some of your family be left behind and have to face the Antichrist?